have unconditional love and admiration for my family. If I could tell anyone one thing about me, it would be that. While I don't have the words to describe why they're the most important part of my life, I do have the words to tell you all a little bit about them. My mom's parents, my Lolo and Lola, both immigrated to America from different villages in the Philippines. My Lola is the epitome of resilience. While she was still a child and Japan occupied the Philippines during World War II, her father went into hiding because he was so fair-skinned that Japanese soldiers believed him to be American. At one point, he was found and then hung upside down by his feet in the town's courtyard as my Lola watched. It wasn't until hours later that he was finally let down and returned to his family. When she was in sixth grade, 11 or 12 years old, she was sent to her aunt's house by her dad. Once she was there, she was treated as a maid. Before school every morning, she had to scrub the floors and wash their clothes, only to be belittled years later by her aunt telling her that medical school was for men and making her abandon the aspirations of wanting to be a doctor. Instead, she forced my Lola to think about becoming a pharmacist. My Lola's aunt told her that she would pay for all of her college education if she was valedictorian of her high school. Of course, my Lola did just that. She graduated first in her class, so it was no surprise that when she deliberately tried to fail out of the classes necessary for a future in pharmaceuticals, since she didn't want to start a career out of it, she could not bring her grade low enough to change majors. The loss of her scholarship came from failing gym class. When she was younger, she almost drowned in her town's river, so she refused to get into the pool for swimming when it came about time in class. She ultimately finished school, and her dad wanted her to come to the United States in hopes for a better future. As a final thank you for looking over one of her aunt's stores while she was away in Hong Kong, my Lola received a gift. So she came to America with $15, a Rolex, and sticks in her ears to prevent her piercing from closing on the trip overseas. Through the years, her savviness proved successful, and she made her way to New Jersey, where she met my Lolo. My Lolo grew up in Romblone, a small island in the central Philippines that is only accessible by various water routes. When he was young, he loved to skip studying for school and play pool with his friends, a scene of which is hard to believe, considering he spent most of his time sitting in the house reading his academic journals and playing chess while my mom was growing up. Living on the island made him a very good swimmer and gave him a love for both swimming and eating fish. Or, er, <laughs> sorry, for both fishing and eating fish. Despite his family having owned and operated a marble quarry, where you dig up and extract unrefined marble from the ground, he grew up relatively poor. He was living with an outhouse and no plumbing when he applied to college and later medical school. Eventually, after he got accepted into and later graduated from the best medical school in the Philippines, he would study with the lights off quietly by candlelight out of fear that his landlord would notice him and come knocking for the rent that he did not have. Similar to my Lola, he was incredibly intelligent and hardworking. His determination led him to be exempt from all of his college exams since his grades were among the best in his class. It wasn't until the day of the final exam that the teacher would read a list of names that were allowed to leave class based on the grades they acquired that year and every single time his professor called his name. He graduated from school in the Philippines and immigrated to the United States where he had to get relicensed since the qualifications in the two countries were not the same. He ended up becoming a doctor at a psychiatric hospital in Poughkeepsie where he raised my mom and her siblings. Over time, he seemed to have rediscovered a few passions from his childhood. His love of both singing and and cooking is evident whenever I visit him and my Lola. On three televisions in separate rooms, he plays a different episode of Barefoot Contessa, while a CD of him singing karaoke to My Way by Frank Sinatra plays throughout the house. My mom grew up on the grounds of the psychiatric hospital my Lola worked at. Her home was among different patient housing, medical facilities, abandoned buildings, and the local church. With her siblings, one sister, and two brothers, she would explore the grounds at night with flashlights while each of them tried their hardest to scare the others. They would make up stories about the patients that wandered past their windows on their daily strolls 
and used their willow-like backyard tree as a natural fort for their endeavors. She would bike to the baseball field with her siblings, where she got good at playing catch with the younger brother, Carl, until she got hit in the face with a baseball during a game and refused to play any time afterwards. Her athletic abilities would not be present in her development until she was captain of her cheer team in high school, where she always boasts that she got fourth at nationals. It wasn't until the third time I heard her mention it that I found out there were only four teams competing. She went to college at Union, where she began school as a political science major, then switched to math and economics after realizing that it did not matter what major she needed to take in order to go to law school in the future. Her first job out of law school was as a volunteer with the Dutchess County Bar Association, where she then got in touch with a couple of attorneys looking for associates. Her first paid work was with a small bankruptcy practice. She had a lot of fun doing research, going to court, and making money. She ended up leaving two years later when she was working on a case with a pretty novel issue of law, leading the judge to call both sides for oral argument many, many times. The person she was arguing against was a partner at a different law firm with one of my mom's friends and was so impressed with her work during the case that he started asking about her around the office. He later invited her to interview for the practice he worked at. Eventually, she took on part-time hours to spend more time with her children, my brother, my sister, and me. To celebrate, my dad gave her a locket where one side said part-time attorney and the other full-time mom. However, when she became a partner, she went back to working full-time. I was frequently with my mom while she was working and in one instance, my Lola had to watch me in the stroller outside of the room where my mom was doing her continued learning seminar. Throughout the five hour course, she would periodically come outside and breastfeed me in the bathroom and go back into the class to continue learning. When I was sick, I would wait in the lobby of the courthouse while my mom was in session, bring my sleeping bag to her office where I would lay down on the floor and walk to every office in the building so I could give them a page out of my car's coloring book with the color of their own car. When she wasn't in the office doing work, she was a board member for Children's Media Project, a board member for the Millbrook Library, a CCD teacher, and my sister's Girl Scout troop leader. Over time, her work days became more miserable and she would find herself describing her job as life-sucking. The best part of her job while being a bankruptcy attorney ended up being her volunteer hours with the care service, Credit Abuse Resistance Education, where she gave a seminar to high school students every year for about 11 years on ways to avoid credit abuse. With this in mind, she ended up quitting her job as an attorney and went to graduate school to receive her master's in teaching. After she received her degree and got her job, she felt fulfilled. She was doing something she was passionate about, teaching high schoolers about math, while getting the work-life the work -life balance she had been wanting for years. This newfound ability to spend time with her family, get the weekends off, and have an entire summer free led her to find other things she was passionate about, like gardening. She even managed to inspire the same passion in my dad. My dad grew up in Chappaqua, a town in Westchester, New York. His dad was his doctor and his mom a nurse. In the summers, when he wasn't busy painting houses during his sophomore year of high school, he would accompany his dad, my babu, to work. While Babu was doing his rounds in the hospital he worked at, my dad would get breakfast at a local coffee shop, then meet up with him after his shift. Then my dad would go with him to his medical practice where he was put to work filling out and filing paperwork, taking EKGs, and retrieving stool and urine samples. The best part of his day was sitting in the car, listening to the radio, driving along the east side as the day wrapped up and they were on their way home together. Sometime during his summers, he would go to Cape Cod with his family, where he made a new friend. One day, he met a boy around his age, maybe six years old at the time, who happened to be blind. This boy challenged my dad to a game of horseshoe, and my dad promptly said yes because he thought that there wasn't any way he could lose. Turns out, he was wrong, and his new friend quickly beat him, and pretty badly too. After the game, he was invited back to his friend's house for a bowl of Lucky Charms, when he sat down and poured himself a bowl, he found out that the mom had removed all of the marshmallows from the box. Uh, he says that he went home with two losses that day. When he was older, he didn't feel a pressure to pursue medicine, but he did feel the general pressure to be professional in some field. To his father's dismay, he drove across the country after he graduated college, spent a few years in Los Angeles. 
When he got to LA, he started to work at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. He worked his way up to assistant manager and was delivering cars to people like Ringo Starr during his hair appointments. I wondered how he went from working at rental car service to becoming a high school history teacher. When I asked him, he was debating on whether or not to be honest. There was a buildup of signs throughout his time in Los Angeles. When he was promoted to assistant manager, he enjoyed the time he spent teaching lower level employees and new hires how to do certain jobs and tasks. In one instance, a person he was shuttling brought up how he was going to school to be a teacher and shared his passion with my dad. At the time, he was also dating someone who left Enterprise to become a teacher. In addition, he had a few high school teachers who left remarkable impressions and served as role models. There were already seeds planted in the back of his mind, but his moment of realization was at a Grateful Dead concert where he dropped acid and experienced one of the most enlightening moments of his life. He said that while he was laying down on the grass, staring up at the stars, with the music slowly fading in the background, the stars began to pulse in the form of geometric shapes. After a little while, the shapes got increasingly closer, then shot through his body, ultimately making him feel like he was shooting through space. In this moment, he realized that nothing in life really mattered to the extent that he should be pursuing what he is passionate about. So he went back to the Northeast for his master's degree in teaching. While I was growing up and still am, I always knew how strong and courageous my dad was. However, the moment I realized that he was the most courageous person I would ever meet was when he came out to my family as bisexual when he was 53 years old on Father's Day. He recalled the time when he came out that I was sad that he never got the opportunity to tell his parents, but he's at peace with the idea that they both had always known from his childhood that he was different. My Nana, my dad's mom, had a good heart. She struggled with alcoholism and a variety of issues that led her to try to kill herself. My dad was just one. However, I always remember her as warm, loving, and as a passionate poet. I couldn't describe much about her life, but I can read one of her poems, The Country for Her Body. Having turned away as one turns from a mirror, I went home to Ireland when she died. Leaning over the country of her body, I recited the caddish of a silver-backed brush sliding through her hair the morning I ran off for good. From the back of my skull, I took down the oval mirror I've carried for years to see once more her eyes, green as the sea-green bowl she kept her pins in, how they saw through me and the pack of lies I handed her. I'm staying over at a friend's house for a few days before the kitchen door clicked shut between us, and I walked carefully down the hall, a ticket to New York holding its breath in my pocket. It may seem odd to come up here and talk about people you don't even know, but the best way I can express my identity is through their stories and the experiences that they have lived. Thank you.